Hello, and welcome to episode 18 of On Liberty, coming to you live from the Center for Independent Studies in Sydney, Australia. I'm your host, Salvatore Bavonis, and joining me today is Oliver Hartwich, Executive Director of the New Zealand Initiative in Wellington, New Zealand. I'll be talking to Oliver about New Zealand politics and the lingering economic impact of celebrity Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern's handling of the coronavirus crisis. Oliver Hartwich, how are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining us today from, what do they say in this part of the world? Neither of us are natives. It's it's across the ditch. Indeed. <laughs> Being on this side of the ditch, I sometimes forget. Uh, look, I, I'd like to go back to something you wrote two months ago. On May 29th, you wrote that, and I'm sorry for quoting you, no one ever likes to be quoted back to himself. The current narrative in our media is that it was great leadership and flawless execution that got us through this crisis. But you don't agree with that appraisal. What's your own view of what got New Zealand through the crisis? Well, first of all, my assessment hasn't really changed since then. I think um, there is a narrative out there in the international media, also in parts of the New Zealand media, that um, indeed this government has actually saved this country. It has navigated us us, uh, through this COVID crisis and beaten the virus. And to a degree, of course, that is true, because New Zealand is practically virus-free, apart from a few cases in managed isolation that is in quarantine. But what I would say is actually that New Zealand, of all countries in the world, always had a really good chance of beating the virus because of our geography. So New Zealand, a country the size of Italy or the UK, with a population of just around 5 million, practically no big cities apart from Auckland, and even Auckland has a low population density. If there was one country in the world, that had a really good chance of beating COVID-19, it was New Zealand. So the government, yes, they put us into lockdown, probably a much stronger lockdown that would have been required. Um, but I think there was always a very good chance that New Zealand would get it under control. And don't forget, it, it took until late February, until New Zealand actually got its first case. So we had a chance to actually watch COVID-19 unfold in other parts of the world. We could see COVID-19 yeah. on the television. So we had time to prepare. Right. Right. And now you say New Zealand got through the crisis. Are, are we confident? I mean, what what's what procedures are in place to make sure that there isn't a new outbreak of coronavirus in New Zealand? Oh, we've we've got this um, 1200 mile moat around our country. It's <laughs> the Tasman Sea. There is no other way to reach New Zealand. Um, and that makes it easy, at least in theory, to manage our borders. So we have protections. Um, Currently, you can only travel to New Zealand if you are a New Zealand citizen or resident. Everybody else has to apply for um, a special permission to enter the country, and it is really difficult to get, and we can talk about that later. So um, you then have to go into two weeks quarantine. You're tested on day three. You're tested again on day 12. um, And then only if you're negative, you're released. So that is quite a good protection to have. Um, Of course, it requires the government uh, to handle this properly. And we've had a few bungles at the border, so the government actually didn't get this quite right at the beginning. But at the moment, at least, touch wood, it appears as if that is under control. Right. We actually had a a paper here in April at CIS on the argument that Australia's coronavirus crisis was a border security crisis, not a public health crisis. And that paper was ignored, leading to our renewed coronavirus crisis as Victoria completely fumbled border security. Uh, is New Zealand handling border security more efficiently than Victoria? Well, um, let's put it this way. Yesterday we had reports in the New Zealand media that seven guards at a quarantine facility fell asleep on the job. <laughs> that doesn't actually inspire confidence here. Yeah. We had other cases, of course, where the Ministry of Health organized a birthday party for children in quarantine from different flights and different arrival dates. So they were really asking for it. We had a very... Um, well-known case where two travelers who arrived from England were in managed isolation in Auckland, but they wanted to see um, their parent because their other parent had just passed away. Unfortunately, the parents were in Wellington. So the ministry allowed them to actually take a car from a friend and drive down from Auckland to Wellington without having had a test on the condition that they would get tested on arrival in Wellington. And guess what? They were positive. Mm. So, um, I mean, I'm not sure how familiar you are with New Zealand geography, but the idea that you could just drive nine hours from Auckland to Wellington Strait without refueling or doing anything else along the way was always a bit, naya, not quite sure. 
So I think they didn't handle this well. They had a number of cases, of course, where people absconded from managed isolation from quarantine facilities. So um, that wasn't particularly uh, ha handled particularly well. The government admitted that, basically, mm -hmm. took the responsibility from um, one minister, pa minister, passed it on to another, and called on the army to sort it all out. So when we are looking from New Zealand at uh, Victoria, that could have happened to us. Um, we yeah. were lucky again. I thought, so I, this is a bit of an aside, I thought New Zealand didn't have an army anymore. Uh, well, not much of an army to speak of, but yes, enough to at least um, do a better job than the Ministry of Health. <laughs> Let's hope so. I'm just going to say some hellos to our viewers. We have uh, Anthony Elizabeth uh, from New Jersey joining us all the way from the United States. Uh, the obvious troll, Paul. Paul is not the obvious troll. That is, we have the obvious troll and Paul listening today. Uh, Ross, you know, all our regulars out there. So, Gay, uh, thanks everyone for listening, for watching. We appreciate it. We'll get to your questions in just a few minutes. But if you want to start feeding questions through, we'll start accumulating them. So, please do. Uh, Oliver, we know New Zealand has an election coming up September 19th. Uh, from what I read in the international media, it's not so much an election as a cakewalk coming up. Tell us a little about it. Okay. Well, at the beginning of the year, before the COVID crisis, it looked as if we might even get a change of government. The opposition national party was at about 45% in the polls. And together with um, the ACT party, that would have probably been just enough to actually kick out this government after just one term. Then, of course, COVID happened and uh, we had the same effect that you see in other countries around the world. So in times of crisis, of course, everybody gathers behind the leader um, and actually to the government's credit, they handled the communications in COVID-19 really well. And that led to a uh, surge in the opinion polls for the governing Labour Party of Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. In one opinion poll, believe it or not, uh, Labour's got 60.9%, in another one, 53% either way. It looks like um, the government will be returned, um, probably uh, without the coalition arrangements we currently have. It could well be that we'll have a, a Labour government in its own right, potentially propped up by the Greens. So I think this election, at least from the viewpoint of today, looks like a foregone conclusion. But then again, anything can happen. It's been extremely volatile this year in New Zealand politics. I mean, look at the opposition. The opposition is now to, on their third leader this year. Um, it's been quite an interesting year in New Zealand politics. Right. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you say people, of course, pulled together during the crisis because uh, I'm an American. <laughs> and as I'm sure you know, America has not pulled together in this crisis. I'm just curious what you think, you know, because both of us are expats. Uh, you're, uh, well, I won't get it wrong. You are from? Germany. From originally. Germany. So I, I thought so, but I didn't want to make, make, accidentally make no, a mistake. No, that's fine. And then I uh, spent some time in Britain and I spent some time, of course, at CIS in Australia. Right. So we, we both, you know, expats, we have experience of different countries. Do you feel New Zealand is is particularly a, a pulled together sort of place? What's your own feeling about the country? Well, OK. Um, the one thing that really surprised me was how disciplined New Zealanders were during lockdown. lockdown. I mean, other countries um, do not always follow the rules. Um, you would kind of expect um, this very slavish adherence to the rules from, say, the Germans. But New Zealanders, I would have thought, would have, would have been a bit more difficult to organize. Now, quite the opposite was true, actually. They yeah. followed it, probably led by good communications from the government, and actually New Zealand pulled together for about one and a half months. And they also signaled to the government when they were ready to move to uh, the relaxation levels. Um, so that worked quite well, actually. The government led this crisis in that sense with a good communications policy. The other aspects of that crisis management were probably not so good. Okay. Like, so what was not so good? Well, not so good was, for example, at the beginning of the crisis, no one in government knew how many ventilators there were in New Zealand hospitals. They didn't even have a list. They didn't know. Um, <laughs> they told us that everything was fine. They had enough test kits, for example. Actually, now we know that that's not quite true. Um, but anyway, at least the communication was good. Um, they told us they had enough PPE. Uh, again, we found out later that was not quite the case. They also told us that they had the legal powers um, necessary to put us into lockdown. From what we know now, this is highly dubious whether the government actually was legally um, authorized to put us into lockdown. So the government actually didn't manage the execution parts of the crisis well, but the communication was world class. All right. Now, oh. Jacinda Ardern, uh, Ardern has become a you know global celebrity. Uh, 
uh, prime minister, you know, everyone, everyone loves Jacinda. She has, you know, massive following online social media. How is she perceived in New Zealand? Well, exactly in that way. And probably also because we have a lot of coverage of international news coverage. So whenever there is an article about Jacinda Ardern in the New York Times, or the uh-huh. podcast, that gets reported back immediately in the New Zealand media. And then they say, oh, can't we just proud, be proud of our prime minister because uh, the outside world loves her so much. So she has this image, of course, of being kind and caring, and she really played to that image during the crisis. You may remember she declared at one stage in the crisis that the Tooth Fairy and the Easter Bunny were essential services, uh, even during lockdown. And of course, that made headlines. So she, she actually has cultivated the brand of being a very kind and caring leader. What she doesn't actually do too much, I think, is she doesn't actually lead public debate. She is very opinion poll driven. I heard um, that the government is apparently polling daily now, and they're doing exactly what New Zealanders want, maybe with two or three days delay. Um, So that's Jacinda. Jacinda is also campaigning, of course, um, on a relatively policy-free platform. She told one of our radio shows uh, this week that voters shouldn't really expect too much policy from her in this election. And so far, Labour hasn't announced any policies. Apparently, they want to do this two days before the election. They only have a slogan for the election, and the slogan for the Labour Party in New Zealand is, let's keep moving, as if she was trying to sell gym memberships. (laughs) <laughs> well, but let me ask you, well, first of all, let me remind everyone, please get your questions in the chat box. We have lots of viewers, but no questions coming in yet. We'll go to questions in just about four minutes now. So please do get your questions in uh, in the chat box. Also, we have uh, saying hello from Brisbane. Uh, we had Stephen saying hi. So hello, Stephen. Thanks for watching. Uh, Oliver, look, New Zealand is a democracy. You said that the government is doing continuous polling to find out what people want and give it back to them. What's so wrong with that? I mean, isn't that democracy in action? That is democracy in action. If you're skeptical about uh, democracy, I think that's an interesting case study. Um, What I would say about that is actually that um, it sometimes takes a bit more than just public sentiment. A government should sometimes also lead. And especially when you're looking at the problems with our closed border, you can see why public sentiment is sometimes not the best um, way to decide on public policy. Just give you that example. We have a a tertiary education and actually secondary education export um, sector worth about $5 billion. And um, it would be relatively easy to revive that sector. You could put these um, students into quarantine. You could probably also test them even before they leave their home countries. And our schools and universities are crying out for the return of these students. That could work, except just today we got an opinion poll saying that 68% of New Zealanders do not want to see any opening of the border, and therefore it simply doesn't happen. But the problem actually goes beyond that. The problem goes um, basically to loads of companies in New Zealand. We have surveyed our members, the members of the New Zealand Initiative, and asked them whether they are facing difficulty under the sort of critical um, workers visa um, scheme. And I got reports from lots of companies, big companies in New Zealand, telling us that it is extremely difficult to get people into the country that these companies need. You know, people with specialist engineering skills, they can't come in. So it's massively damaging the economy. So I can understand that ordinary New Zealanders sitting somewhere in the country say, well, actually, why can't we just keep the border closed? It would be for the government to explain that this doesn't really work for the country long run. Right. And we actually do have a bunch of questions starting to accumulate about the economy. So now might be a good time for me to make my plug, which is that we really appreciate your support, not just yours, Oliver. Oliver, by the way, is not charging us his customary speaker's fee for appearing today, but that doesn't mean we don't have expenses to keep the program on the air, in particular, our producer, executive producer, all this wonderful technology. Uh, So please, uh, what we're looking for is if you're not a member of the Center for Independent Studies, please become a member at the $40 minimum level. I think if you do still have a job in the coronavirus crisis, or if you're on uh, job keeper even, uh, please, you know, $40, uh, you could probably afford it. Just click that support link that is in the comments section. Of course, also, please uh, click subscribe and uh, like the video. Also, as a special incentive, uh, you guys knew it was coming. Uh, anybody who would like to join at the $250 level or upgrade your membership to $250, Put the comment in your uh, sign up that you would like a copy of Liberty and Liberalism. I will personally sign a copy 
and send it to you with the dedication of your choice. Also, I hear that Oliver runs a membership organization. Oliver, do you accept individual memberships at the New Zealand Initiative? No, we have a, a slightly different scheme. If you want to join us as a company, you typically pay 45,000 New Zealand dollars. <laughs> I can't. Okay. <laughs> we'll and if you send me 45,000 New Zealand dollars, I will send you a whole library of books. <laughs> well, there you go. $40 for us, $45,000 for Oliver. You choose which one to join. Either way, you get at least one book. Uh, we'd love to have you as a member. Uh, now, we do have a lot of our members already listening. I'd like to get to their questions. We do have one from uh, Gay, I think I saw, which is, how is the local economy in New Zealand recovering from coronavirus when it comes to jobs specifically? Okay. Um, here's a surprising thing. Yesterday, we heard from Statistics New Zealand uh, that the unemployment rate had actually fallen to 4.0% from 4.2 before the crisis. Now, you would think this is a bit counterintuitive. How could that happen? Well, it's statistics, of course. Um, so you're not counted uh, as unemployed if you're not actively seeking um, a new job. And for people being locked down at home, of course, it was difficult seeking new employment. Apart from that, the government introduced a wage subsidy scheme. The condition of the wage subsidy scheme was that people on the scheme couldn't be fired during that period. And so actually the real unemployment rate will be quite a bit higher, but it doesn't show up in uh, the statistics just yet. The um, emergency measures to keep people in employment um, run out roughly around the time of the election. And so we will see the real result on the labor market front in the fourth quarter of this year. Okay. And what are you expecting from that? I mean, what, what's your own feel of the job situation in New Zealand? Well, um, Everybody feels the same in New Zealand, really. We feel that the crisis has been put on hold for us for probably political reasons. So we do not quite see um, the big deterioration in the economy, in the labor market just yet, even though we've had quite a few stories of companies laying off workers or putting them on short time schemes. Um, I think we will only really find out um, in September, October, where we're headed. My gut feel is um, we will see a massive effect simply because um, tourism and um, education, of course, were massively important sectors for the New Zealand economy, and you cannot run them properly if the border remains closed. And you expect the border to remain closed? I mean, does anyone know how long the border will remain closed? Is this in perpetuity? <laughs> well, um, I think we can only look at until the election so far. It will definitely remain closed until then. After that, at least it takes the politici politicization of the border issue away. Uh, we were hoping, of course, to have a travel bubble with you guys in Australia. Um, but for that to happen, our Prime Minister said uh, we would have to see um, 28 days of no community transmission in Australia. So with the figures we got out of Victoria, of course, um, we cannot expect this to happen this year. So the trans tasman uh, travel bubble might happen sometime next year. In the meantime, we might at least open up to some Pacific Islands where there is no COVID-19. We might open, um, even though that's politically difficult, to Taiwan because they also have the virus under control. We might open to some other places where they have a similar level of um, COVID management um, as New Zealand. Beyond that, we will see. I think it will not be sustainable keeping the border closed forever. Um, and especially not if the rest of the world at some stage gets into this kind of COVID fatigue where they say, OK, we haven't got it under control, but we can't stay in lockdown forever. We'll just open up. And then we would be in a really strange situation in New Zealand where we would be one of maybe five or six countries in the world with the virus basically eradicated domestically. And we would have to make a strategic choice. Do we want to remain that way or do we want to open up to a world in which it isn't under control? Right, right. And this is ultimately the herd immunity debate uh, over again. Yes, and I mean, of course, it depends on whether we will see a vaccine. Um, I don't know. I've heard very conflicting stories on that. And, and even if we've got a vaccine, it has to be made available and produced in sufficient numbers. So um, I think New Zealand will have a debate next year how we want to be in a COVID-ridden world. Um, do we want to remain in our splendid isolation with borders closed, with all of the negative side effects, not just on the economy, but on just families unable to see each other? Or do we want to open up and um, maybe increase our tracing capacity or testing capacity? That will probably shape the debate in New Zealand in 2021. All right. Well, just hold on. And I'm sure America next year will get you a really fantastic vaccine, not just any vaccine, but a fantastic one. <laughs>
Tremendous. Uh, <laughs> a tremendous one. Hey, Sally uh, on, is watching us on Facebook. She has a question about this travel bu bubble issue. Are you in favor of opening the travel bubble? Or at this point, would you keep it closed? And she's especially interested in you know, Australia, Tasmania, you know, New, Zeal New Zealand, and of course, Melbourne being the big question. Well, I'm, I'm totally in favor of um, opening the border safely. So I wouldn't open the border, of course, for anyone and just coming in without any tests and quarantine. But if it's possible to safely open the border in, in a sense that people coming in would have to go into um, managed isolation, get properly tested, then I'm totally in favor of that. I think we need to scale up um, the quarantine capacity because we're currently already at um, our capacity limit. And we made some recommendations. Our chief economist, Eric Crampton, put out a paper um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's called Safe Arrivals. We have some very practical ideas on how we could actually organize this because we need to also take it away from politicians. We need to take the um, authority of you know, deciding on individual cases away from politicians. We should rather auction it and we should definitely make it possible for us to um, scale up quarantine facilities because it is just putting too much of a burden on the economy and on families. Right. Now, the obvious troll who which I think is John Howard's Twitter handle. I'm not sure. The obvious troll says, uh, what can Victoria take away from recent events? Uh, you know, putting aside the blame issues with the Andrews government, uh, what can Victoria learn? And, you know, what would be your next moves if you were advising the Victorian government? Oh, dear. Um, I've actually been thinking about this question the other way around. What can we learn from Victoria? Because I think we should learn from your negative example. Victoria, actually the whole of Australia, looked as if you were on the same path as New Zealand. And um, we were really hopeful to open the travel bubble with Australia very soon, and then this happened in Victoria. So I think it is actually a lesson for us here that we don't want to end up like Melbourne, and we have to make sure that our quarantine facilities are, are working properly. And I told you, we had exactly the same kind of bungles that you had um, observed in, in Melbourne, and uh, we were just lucky that the virus didn't escape, or at least we don't know about that yet. Um, so I think the learning should actually be the other way around. For, for Victoria itself, well, if you want to eradicate the virus, um, the kind of lockdown that you're embarking on now, that's the way to go. Um, what I just observed, and I've lived in Australia twice actually, um, you can't compare the political debates. The political climate in Australia is completely different to, to New Zealand. In New Zealand, you had at the beginning of lockdown a very wide consensus, really from lefties to raging libertarians that the country should go into lockdown, we should eradicate this thing and then we move on. Um, I don't think you have anything like this in Australia. When I watch your debates and when I read your newspapers, it appears to me that the debate in Australia is far more polarized and, and well, harsher actually than in New Zealand. So I'm not sure whether you could easily apply what we have had in New Zealand to Australia. I think um, that kind of Jacinda Ardern leadership style wouldn't fly in Australia. All right. Well, I might use the word robust <laughs> instead yes. of harsh. But uh, on that leadership style issue, we have a question from Chris. And uh, look, I'm just going to read the question because uh, I'll never get it right if I don't read this question directly. Uh, how does the current government in New Zealand operate, given that it is a mixture of labor, New Zealand first, parentheses, Winston Peters detests the Greens, and the Greens, parentheses, they detest Winston Peters? Yeah, that's a very good question. I've been trying to figure that out for the past three years. Um, it's a government by Australian standards that would be um, a mixture of Labour, uh, Pauline Hanson and the Greens. Um, you can imagine that that sometimes doesn't work that well. Um, actually, from a purely political management perspective, they kind of made it stick together, more or less. Um, the uh, frictions within the coalition government are now becoming more visible in the election campaign, but that's unavoidable because um, the two smaller coalition partners, they want to be heard and they don't want to just um, fall un under the radar when everybody's just focusing on Jacinda Ardern as um, the celebrity prime minister. But actually political management wise, they managed to keep this together, surprisingly, because as you say, the parties are totally different. Um, and uh, it's no great secret, secret um, that Winston Peters um, really despises the Greens. The Greens don't like Winston Peters. There are all sorts of animosities between the three parties. Considering that, surprisingly, they kept it together for three years. Right. Now, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 
Paul uh, wanted to know if Jacinda Ardern will likely resort to, maybe New Zealand will be the first country in the world to resort to modern monetary theory. Uh, he thinks it sounds like her sort of theory. Uh, do you think it's possible that New Zealand will be the, you know, the first country in the world to take up MMT? And also, if you feel qualified, if you could give a tiny explanation of what modern monetary theory is for those listeners who might not know it. Okay, I'm not sure whether New Zealand is really that different from other countries around the world, because every country, every major country seems to be embarking on quantitative easing, so a virtual printing of money, uh, their central banks. Um, modern monetary theory, believe it or not, is not even a big issue in New Zealand uh, just yet. I noticed that there is a lot more talk about this in Australian newspapers these days, and I've read Alan Kohler's article about that, I've seen Adam Crichton's responses. Um, in New Zealand, I think what we're seeing is just a central bank that has uh, initially embarked on a 60 billion New Zealand dollar uh, quantitative easing program. We're all expecting this to go up. Um, the central bank is actually meeting again next week, and then we will see whether it goes up to 90 billion or 120 billion. Um, it is dangerous, of course, um, for the central bank and the government to proceed in this way if you are New Zealand. Um, larger economies can get away with that. I mean, if the Federal Reserve does this kind of stuff, um, people have limited options to move out of the US dollar because it's still the leading currency in the world. Um, for New Zealand, of course, the problem is nobody really has to be invested here. If at some stage um, international investors become nervous about New Zealand, um, nobody really has to be here. And New Zealand's been there before in the 1980s and 90s. And I talked to people who were involved in monetary and fiscal policy at the time. Their biggest concern is that at some stage, um, the outside world international markets just lose patience with what's happening here. Say, well, actually, now um, we don't trust the New Zealand dollar. You can borrow from us, but you'll borrow in yen or euro or US dollars or anything else on our conditions. And at that point, it would become really difficult for New Zealand because we are already at a very negative net international investment position. So put simply, New Zealand owes the world more than the world owes New Zealand. And so when you're in that position and then f facing fiscal problems, it is really difficult. And one last thing, the thing that really keeps us awake at night um, at the initiative is just a thought. We are on the rim of fire, the, uh, the ring of fire. We are mm -hmm. um, a country that's prone to natural disasters, earthquakes, volcanoes, that kind of stuff. If that happens and the government needs to rebuild parts, parts of the country, parts of the economy, we will not be in a good position to borrow. And so I think we have to be extremely careful when it comes to these modern monetary operations. Um, New Zealand cannot afford that. Right. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you, Bradley, uh, for watching. And if you want to feed a question through to us, we'd love to hear it. Uh, Sue is asking a question that I believe is rhetorical, but I'm going to throw it at you anyway, and you can make what you want of it. Why do we in Australia need quarantine coming back from New Zealand? When New Zealand's supposedly COVID-free, do you think Australia should be quarantining New Zealanders coming to visit us? Uh, no, I don't think so, actually, <laughs> because um, we are practically COVID-free, apart from yeah. currently, I think, 23 or 24 cases in quarantine. Right. So right. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any risk, or any at least not a high risk, um, of catching any kind of COVID infection from uh, people resident in New Zealand. Right. Now, we, you've, supposedly, you've presumably heard of Australia's uh, recent confrontations with China over the World Health Organization and over, well, over just about everything. Uh, Anthony is curious, is New Zealand having any problems with exports to China? Or let me just broaden that out. Has there been any flare up in New Zealand's China relations? The relationship is um, becoming increasingly difficult. I would say it is not quite as difficult as yours. Um, but of course, China was annoyed at the beginning of the year when uh, New Zealand closed the border for Chinese students. Right. Then again, um, New Zealand didn't really have much choice because if we wanted to keep our um, arrangement with Australia, we had to follow Australia on that one. We had absolutely no leeway to make our own foreign policy on this one. New Zealand, in some ways, is a foreign policy taker um, from Australia. So um, the relationship with China... Um, got difficult. Um, we've got a few difficulties actually in that relationship. But if I look at Australia and um, the level of confrontation between the Australian government and the Chinese government, especially around the South China Sea as well, um, that's different. What I would say though is um, China cannot easily replace 
the imports it currently gets from Australia. It could definitely easily replace the stuff it gets from New Zealand. So in that way, we are more vulnerable. And the other way I would argue is um, that whatever happens to Australia has direct implications for us because um, Australia is still our largest trading partner. And um, when the Australian economy tanks because of um, Chinese sanctions, for example, we will definitely feel that here. Right. Now, Ross would like to know your views on the kind of the two extremes that have been compared internationally, because, of course, we see New Zealand as a, as a case study, whereas you see New Zealand as a place you live. Uh, he's curious about this New Zealand-Sweden comparison, uh, the two different coronavirus strategies of you know, complete eradication and keep it out versus protect people in your country who need protection and otherwise stay open. Do you have a view on which of those would be preferred? And his, his follow-up question is, well, you know, if you eradicate it, doesn't that mean that you, know, you remain isolated forever? Yes, and that question is really not um, easy to answer because I think you can't compare the countries. Um, I mean, New Zealand is um, a country that's um, surrounded, as I said before, by a large mold. It was possible to keep the virus out. Right. Um, if, if you're Sweden, of course, uh, you just look at the geography of Europe, it's, it's a lot harder. So I think for European countries, there never really was the chance to be another New Zealand um, with complete eradication strategies in place that simply wouldn't work. Um, the other thing I would say, I think it is just too early to say whether this will work. It depends on too many variables that we have absolutely no control over. If the, virus arri if, if the vaccine arrives next year, then New Zealand will be vindicated. We would have actually kind of sailed through this crisis and uh, we would have kept um, the economy relatively intact, um, and then we could open again. If, however, the vaccine doesn't arrive, then New Zealand is in a real strategic dilemma because um, we cannot defend our current COVID-free status forever. We will at some stage have to reopen. We can probably have a gradated opening where we just um, try to do this with quarantine facilities in the, in the meantime. But at some stage, we'll have to make a strategic choice. Do we want to be part of the world again or not? I think it's just too early to say whether uh, New Zealand or Sweden will be um, the best examples in the crisis. And mind you, even Sweden had an 8% correction in GDP in the last quarter, right. which is probably a little bit better than the 12% in the Eurozone. But still, um, they felt the economic implications despite actually taking a much more relaxed um, stance on the virus. Right. The obvious troll wants to ask about the Reserve Bank and the structure of the Reserve Bank in New Zealand. So here we get a little more technical. Now, he or she asks, I still think it's John Howard, so I'm going to go with he, that uh, asks, is the Reserve Bank private or state-owned? Now, I assume there's not a private Reserve Bank in New Zealand, but uh, to what extent is it an independent central bank versus a political central bank? Huh. Very good question. Um, well, first of all, it's of course not a private institution. It is part of the New Zealand government. It has independence under the Reserve Bank of New Zealand Act. Um, the independence is for the Reserve Bank to set monetary policy. Initially, the focus for the Reserve Bank was price stability. That's been changed. Um, about a couple of years ago, they got an extended mandate. They're now also responsible for achieving maximum sustainable employment. Um, that is a bit of a contradiction because, um, as we know in economics, um, central banks should focus on price stability because they have, at least in the medium term, no in influence and impact on employment levels. But that's basically the setup of the Reserve Bank. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand is a bit different from the Reserve Bank of Australia in one aspect. It is also responsible for a lot more regulatory functions. The things that in Australia are dealt with by APRA, that is all part of the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Um, the independence now, the political independence of the Reserve Bank, that is a, an interesting question now because um, especially when you move towards quantitative easing, you enable the Reserve Bank to pursue other goals, um, social goals, political goals, environmental mm. goals, simply by the choice of papers that it wishes to buy in the end. Mm. And we've been very critical of that um, at the initiative and um, pointed out that there is a danger of politicization for the RBNZ. Um, the other problem is actually, in some ways, the Reserve Bank lacks adequate um, checks and balances. So we've seen um, just before the crisis an exercise in increasing the tier one capital of New Zealand banks. It's a very technical thing, but basically it means that New Zealand banks would have to find between 15 and 20 billion dollars of new capital. Now that was um, basically introduced through the Reserve Bank, where the Reserve Bank governor was judge and jury and um, basically everything in one person. 
And we still haven't seen a convincing proper cost benefit analysis of this, but it was introduced because he operates basically um, in his own capacity without any real oversight. There is no um, proper board for the Reserve Bank checking on the um, performance of the governor in his regulatory capacity. The Minister of Finance doesn't do that. So we, we think there are some problems for the current setup of the Reserve Bank, and we also see some problems in the person of the current governor of the Reserve Bank, who, in our view at least, um, goes too much for fashionable topics and likes to in, engage himself in political debates. Mm. And we still haven't heard any substantive speech from him on monetary policy. Oh, really? <laughs> for two years, we have, we've been waiting for a clear um, exposition of his views on monetary policy, and we haven't heard it yet. Wow. Uh, what Simon is asking, he says, you've been at both the Center for Independent Studies and the New Zealand Initiative. Uh, he feels there's similar organizations. Wants to know, what are you working on right now at the New Zealand Initiative? And he's implying to work towards a free, prosperous and fair society. That's right. Um, well, we, we have been working um, on issues ranging from education to housing and local government, um, welfare state issues, um, and now, of course, the COVID issues, basically from the time we started in 2012. One of our focus areas has always been education. We have done, uh, I think, really world-leading research on education policy because New Zealand is um, quite unusual as a country. Um, we have something that no other country has. We have... We, we have an integrated data infrastructure in Statistics New Zealand, which basically binds all government data together into one database. And we have had access to that. And in analyzing this database, we took the data for 400,000 New Zealand students. Anyone who's gone through the secondary education system in the last 10 years is in that database. And for the first time, actually, worldwide, we were able to separate individual factors from, um, from school factors and in analyzing student performance. And um, we have been doing a lot of research on that. We can tell you exactly how schools are performing across the deciles. Um, we are just about to release another report next week where we look at the performance of private schools compared to public schools and state integrated schools. So this is really um, cutting edge innovative research on education. Mm -hmm. We're doing practical work currently on border issues. Um, we're trying to find ways um, in which New Zealand could safely re-engage with the world. So that's a big focus. And of course, we've got um, a minor distraction currently, and that's the election. So we're trying to um, advise the government, the future government, whoever it might be, on, on what issues they should tackle. So it's, it's quite a comprehensive research agenda. Just last week, we published on health policy on the government's monopoly drug buying agency. So as you can see, it's a very diverse um, range of topics that we cover. Right. And I'm interested to hear you mention education because, of course, you know, that's a big uh, effort here at the Center for Independent Studies. And today in the Sydney Morning Herald, there's an article featuring uh, our own uh, alumna, Jennifer Buckingham, and her five from, 5 from 5 program that's been featured today in the Sydney Morning Herald. If you'd like to find out more about 5 from 5, we did an entire On Liberty about it. So you can go back, look at our archives, and you'll find the link if you just search On Liberty 5 from 5 or Jennifer Buckingham that should pop up. Look, we're going to move to a final question just as we wrap up here, Oliver. And I'm going to push you a little bit on this one because uh, you've talked about, you know, you've been critical of the government, but you haven't offered an alternative strategy for how New Zealand's economy should be managed. I mean, you've criticized the government for not having an election uh, program, an election agenda. What's your program or what is the New Zealand Initiatives program for rebooting the New Zealand economy post-election? Okay. Um, I mean, since we have another five hours, um, I'm happy to run <laughs> that. We have um, actually done a lot of work on that. Um, so in the immediate focus for us has to be the border. The border is the crucial uh, tool to re-engage with the world. We have to find ways to scale up migration capacity, immigration capacity. That means we need to bring more um, facilities on stream to enable um, people to come into New Zealand, whether that's students or uh, essential workers for companies or actually anyone who really wants to work in New Zealand. I mean, especially as um, America seems to be in crisis, New Zealand could actually provide a, a safe um, haven for Americans wishing to lead a normal life with a slightly more normal government. Um, so <laughs> we should let these people in. And that would actually help us to revive some of our worst hit industries that would probably help us with tourism as well it was help, would help us with our education provider. So that's the immediate concern. Long term, 
You well, just, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you just gave a plug for Jacinda Ardern, by the way. I want to make that clear. Well, well, I'm so <laughs> relative. <laughs> You know what, you, you could probably fit the whole New Zealand political spectrum into the U.S. Democrats. Uh -huh. From the left to the right, it is all fitting into one party. So that's basically New Zealand for you. Um, so that's the immediate thing, opening the border, re-engaging with the world safely, of course. In the long term, I think what New Zealand really needs to do is it needs to lift its productivity levels. So that's been a problem actually for New Zealand over the last three decades. Our productivity performance is abysmal. Um, we are not improving. We are actually falling further behind the world. And we have actually laid out a um, program in our work, in our research, how we could change that. So key to that long term is education. Our education performance is not good enough. We think we need to reform the assessment system that our schools operate under. We need to have a better curriculum. We need to do all the wonderful things that Jennifer Buckingham talks about at CRS because we've got exactly the same problems you have in Australia. The other thing I would change for New Zealand, we need to fix the housing crisis. Um, we have made very clear recommendations on that. So New Zealand is unfortunately one of the most centralized countries in the world, where local government is constantly asked, can you please build for us? Can you zone for development? But when it comes to it, we'll leave them alone with finance and the infrastructure and they don't get any taxes in return. It's no wonder it doesn't work. It has to be fixed. Regional development, New Zealand, big issue. We have recommended special economic zones where we actually relax regulations on a localized basis, regional basis, and let people figure out how they can actually solve their problems in a more creative way than waiting for some bureaucrats from Wellington. So we've got some very clear and practical recommendations on how to revive the economy. And one last thing, because it's also a matter that applies to Australia, we need to be more welcoming to international capital. Unfortunately, we have capital xenophobia both in Australia and in New Zealand. And I know that um, people in, um, at, at CIS, starting with Wolfgang Kasper probably decades ago, have actually made that point to really reap the benefits of globalization and integration with the world economy. We need to attract more capital into the country because that will actually link us better into international value chains. That's a, pr a problem for Australia. It's a problem for New Zealand. So if I want to revive the economy in three key points, education, overseas investment, and decentralization would be my points. Well, that sounds like a perfectly solid program for Australia as well. Uh, Thank you, Oliver Hartwich, for joining us today. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thanks to all of you for watching. Uh, next week, we will have Andrew Norton, higher education expert at uh, the Australian National University and also a CIS alum as well. Uh, we'd like to thank, oh, I'd like to thank our producer, Emily Holmes, our executive producer, Max Hawk Weaver. The director of the Center for Independent Studies is Tom Switzer. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see you next week.